uh, from a company called Collabnet. We are a product development company. So you have heard from the title, developers want change, ops want control. So you guys can guess, you know, it's mostly about DevOps. I want the session to be more interactive. I want folks to, you know, ask questions in the, in the middle and, you know, it's mostly knowledge sharing, your experiences, things like that. So how many of you, you know, have faced this challenge where, you know, you develop a code, it works in your environment, but it fails miserably in production. Okay. That's good. I see a few hands. Okay. And uh, some of the things I'm going to discuss is about uh, our experience, how we're able to solve few things in our DevOps environment internally as part of a product development company. And I'll also quickly run through a small case study that we are able to solve for our customers. So I'm not going to sell any product and stuff. There are some guidelines, things like that, best practices I'll share. It's up to you guys to go and implement how you want in your company or in your products. So first I'm going to discuss about, you know, what are the challenges operation teams have and what are the challenges, you know, developers have. And we talk about, you know, DevOps value proposition and what are the building blocks in uh, DevOps space, how you can build your own DevOps. So these are like general things and then best practices and how we solve some of the DevOps challenges within our environment in our product. We host our product in cloud, things like that. So you can look at that as a takeaway for you guys and then one of our customers case study. So let's start here. So to, as I started earlier, we always have a tug of war between developers and ops. So developers always want change and they are always in a fast paced environment. They want to develop more, they want to get to the market faster, learn technology and ops typically wants control. They don't want change in their environment because you know they are always tightly uh, network and they don't want to their uh, environment to die or you know fail, things like that. So dev wants agility, ops want stability. So the conflict between the two, they'll be always fight the conflict between the two is what uh, DevOps is all about. So let's see some of the developers challenges. So on the left you see all the developers challenges and the right you see ops challenges. There's a wall in between. So typically everybody knows we are not going to talk about application life cycle here, but you typically everybody knows if you follow practice uh, any life cycle you have like a plan, code, build, test, deploy and then you also have release automation. So developers, now nowadays you know you have challenges where you build a product, you, even our product, it has a desktop application, the same product runs on web, we also have a mobile and uh, the same product has to be tweaked to deploy in a cloud. So all the developers have these challenges and then increasing complexity of the code where nobody you know talks to ops until it goes to staging and then before going to production people talk to ops. Within that time people develop, they get new open source things, tweak their environment, tweak their code, nobody talks to ops. And the third one is you know more uh, agile. As we go through agile we have continuous integration, continuous delivery, things happening faster, more iterations but that same momentum doesn't happen beyond uh, continuous delivery. It takes a lot of time to go from staging to production. Let's see that uh, in future slides. And in case of ops, they have their own challenges. There are so many compliance regulations from the government or uh, so, so many security vulnerability things they have to take care. They have to take care of SLAs. They have their own challenges. And ops doesn't know internals of each and every app they are deploying in production or to their customer because they are in their own space. And uh, ops also want to try to reduce any deployment changes in their infrastructure or upgrading in their uh, environment. So let's see the challenges in industry. So I got uh, two things from Gartner and Forrester. So out of all mission critical application, what Gartner uh, talks about is, you know, 80% or failures are due to, you know, configuration or release integration, handoff issues between ops, between dev and ops, those are 80%. Forrester talks about uh, overall uh, failures where 40% is due to configuration or uh, release management related. So these are some of the industry challenges that exist today. So people can ask me a question. So how do I know whether my dev and ops are, you know, working together? 
how do I recognize this you know there is a problem within dev and ops. So there are few pointers you can have your own checklist you can come up with your own things but I, I just threw few things few points here what happens is in a typical uh, development and life cycle where uh, people deploy code into dev test QA and once you go to QA it takes a while to go to staging and production that means you know that is one of the signs where uh, you have a problem and the next one is uh, failure in deployment you went all the way through and then once you go to staging and once you go to production it fails and ops says it does not work developer says oh it works in all my environment. So things like this few other things you know non compliance risk and uh, some of the non standard process where you know you tell ops to manually tweak something and once it goes from staging to production you do not do that all the way through you have to open up some port in production which you do not do in other environments and there is no documentation procedure. So there are a lot of ad hoc things happen in uh, enterprise application. So all my experience I am going to talk about is mostly for enterprise big customers uh, theme which uh, will be continuing on throughout my presentation as well. So some of the top benefits let me talk about top benefits and then we will get into how the DevOps have been you know incorporated or you know how we solved our challenges. Some of the top benefits we ha have is you know cost improvements where when the application fails in production you have uh, cost you miss your SLA and uh, your productivity is down and you also have you know once you have DevOps in place you are decrease so you can decrease your defects in production and uh, you can also you know improve your agility and some of the other things are you know business uh, things we can talk about is you know traceability where you trace all the way from requirements you have stories you have epics then you know you have uh, test cases tied to them then you have continuous integration and then you go all the way to build after that you know it falls down through your software life cycle where you know you should try to improve your traceability that will also help uh, have a solid solution. And then uh, last one is you know, align all your stakeholders between you know dev ops even your business people where uh, it will be easy for someone you know to go to time to market faster. So let us see how it works this is a simple workflow it is not uh, any product or a tool and uh, when I talked about traceability and from your workflow you can see you know developers they develop a code and then um, somebody does a build and then it goes to QA, QA tests the code and then it goes to ops and then somebody manually deploys or you know you can automate it. Let us see how we improve our DevOps. So when these things happen there is more frequent sprints and then even this happens in our workplace where we have very frequent sprints we do continuous integration and we deploy and then there is a bottleneck because QA does the same turnaround because dev and QA are embedded it is in a agile space they are all same and you know they do things faster between sprints end of a sprint you have some testable code that is around. So all these things builds get backlogged in QA it takes some time it is not in the same time frame where it goes to uh, staging or uh, production. So third uh, challenge is you know when you go to different environments in our case we have a product where it has to run on uh, Windows, it has to run on CentOS, it has to run on SUSE, it has to work in mobile and it has to work in all cloud private cloud or internal cloud uh, platform as well as uh, public uh, cloud that are available in the industry. So if you look at it when you build we have to make sure it works any feature works in all these platforms. So the way we implemented uh, DevOps you can for this discussion you know you can think about having a small robo where you know you tell the robo like I have finished all the continuous integration delivery and then you know we tell the robo that these are the deliverables that are here and we take this build and it goes to this environment and uh, this is the workflow it has to go through this many approval process and uh, QA approves it then it goes to release manager who approves it it goes to uh, ops who approves it. So you can build this kind of workflow within your system and it can be homegrown or you can use open source you can use tools that is available in the industry and then the biggest challenge we have is when you go through multiple platform there are a lot of configuration things that happens where if it is a Linux or a Unix kind of thing you have directory structures are different if it is a Windows your directory structures are different and when you build mobile apps 
it has to work in uh, Android and uh, iPhone, things like that. So a lot of configuration things that has to be tweaked before you know going to uh, deployment. So those things you have to somehow you know externalize or you know there are other tools available or you can do homegrown. So in our case many things we have done homegrown stuff and uh, you can also come uh, look at some of the case studies in our website. So as I mentioned earlier <coughs> like a robo where you know it tracks you record all these things and then you know ask it to play. So when you go for a next release again configuration changes. So your whole operation steps that has been manually done it is kind of codified in our case where it is all you know written in code kind of. So when next release something changes we change our workflow, we change our uh, model and then you know again play it for the next release. So this happens release after release. So I will show you how this uh, will be done from a story perspective how our ops are doing. So let me explain to you the building blocks for DevOps. When you start going and building your own DevOps space for your own environment or your product, first thing is packaging which I said you have to make sure for example it is a web app, it is a year file or it is something else you know you zip them and then unzip. So all these things you have to decide for from our perspective I will say you know we have like four different kinds of packaging because we are having four different products. So this packaging strategy has to be defined after continuous delivery. You can again do that through however you want. So you decide you know for web app it goes as a year file for my windows is an exe how we build it and package them together which is slightly different. So this is for first building blocks you need and the next one is a workflow. I little bit touched on the workflow where when you are deploying your uh, package you want to define first you know shut down my server and then take a backup of all the logs and uh, then you know take a backup of the old version and then take the backup of the data and then deploy the new server, stop the server, things like that. So those kind of workflows you can define again per platform, per environment, things like that which has to be repeatable. So all the things are externalized and nothing is kind of hard coded in the workflow space. The last one is model. This is where your workflow is in place, you have the package, you have the workflow, you have multiple workflows you have defined. Those workflows will be reused in your model where in model where it will say it knows which environment it is deployed like this server and uh, it you have to have your space such a way from your workflow you whatever you are externalized they are all embedded in your model. So you have different models for the same let us say you have a mobile app you want to deploy so you will typically we have like two three models one for iPhone, Android but the basic workflow is same it goes through the same uh, approval process it goes to QA it goes to ops, it goes to release managers. So approval process they are all embedded in your workflow. That does not change regardless of your model. That is just a general concept. Okay. These are some of the things we also looked at and we embedded into our application because we want our product to be you know latest and greatest and from our uh, customers we got some of this uh, DevOps requirements which we embedded into our uh, DevOps as well. Some of the things are like you know scalable, they want our DevOps space to be scalable and uh, it has to be distributed because we are uh, working in a distributed agile teams and you have a ALM uh, space where you use distributed version control, distributed requirement gathering things like that but why not distributed for DevOps that is one thing because you may have several data centers one in east coast and one in west coast and one in Europe. So we, we typically have, we ourselves have three, four data centers, Europe, East Coast and West Coast. So for us, you know, it is very helpful having a distributed environment. And uh, many customers want this solution for them. So what they requested, you know, we need to have some automated engine. I mentioned earlier, you can buy a product or, you know, build something on your own. We have, we have, have a combination of both in our case. They want the space to be also adaptable where they want role based access. Once you have dev and ops tied together, you do not want a developer going into your DevOps tool, clicking on a workflow and trying to push it to production without your knowledge. So there need to be have, we need to have some security, role based access. So things like that are you know, adaptable. And then ALM integration, this is uh, traceability which I covered earlier, where from your continuous integration delivery, 
you want to have traceability who picked this request and you know who approved it who deployed it the last one is compliant where uh, I covered again approval process there need to be a documentation of flow now you know earlier you used to have pages of documents 50 pages of documents where you know per environment per uh, product it is too tiresome for an ops person and ops are also in a rotation they are not in uh, same ops person does not do the same job every day they have day shift night shift different guy comes one guy does half work other guy comes and picks it up. So there are a lot of uh, error that happens and you know it is uh, too many failures in your production. Last one is snapshot where whatever you are trying to build using DevOps try to have a snapshot so that you know you can recover you can roll back wherever you left, left your configuration your data or your uh, version of your product. The next one. So this is a standard uh, DevOps process. So earlier I showed you the workflow and model. So here again it is very similar where you have plan code build test. Once you have uh, done your uh, code and build you try to you know have a configuration manager as a DevOps role where there is not a real human but you know he does all this work for you and then uh, you can uh, deploy. In our case if you see it is already covered there like we have client server app, we have mobile app, we have uh, uh, desktop app and uh, cloud. So all these are uh, built from one app and you know you can push it through through a release automation. And uh, key thing for DevOps is you know, it has to be repeatable. It is not like you know you make it work today and then uh, it works for this version. When you go for the next story, next release, we have to make sure all those requirements are embedded all the way into your next release and stories. So what we try typically practice is when you have a user story, when we have a release, we have a roadmap, we have backlog. What we do is we also have a DevOps stories and uh, those stories have a lot of security things. It has security vulnerability requirements, things like that. And then your know, DevOps also participate in some of the agile uh, practices you follow, like you know sprint reviews, and uh, they also you know uh, take care of looking at our environment and documentation from a customer's perspective. I'll show that uh, in a little while. Okay, this is uh, just uh, overall. DevOps, what are the things that can be streamlined? So I just showed you how uh, out of the packaging workflow and model, how we are able to do like three or four, um, de three or four platform deployments using our product. Now this is just about you know how you can make this successful. You need to have like a DevOps culture within your organization, and it's not a title or anything where you know Dev has to think like Ops, Ops have to think like Dev. And then you also have to streamline your SDLC where you need to have like standardized process. You have to get all your stakeholders together. They need to have an agreement and uh, you need to also have, you know, take care of a lot of things from right from, you know, coordination when you are trying to do this DevOps because anything, you know, once you automate this, when you click off a button, anything again can happen. So there need to be like a coordination effort from um, all the stakeholders all the way from business, not just Dev and Ops. And uh, third point is I already covered where you know you can try to do automation of workflows and uh, tools. Uh, I cannot talk about tools and things but you know you can uh, stop by or look at our case studies later. And the last one is traceability. This is very key where in alignment of metrics in traceability I really love this because after having all this thing in place you need to have again you know KPI, you need to have some metrics. So we track it in a multiple ways where we have uh, feedback from our customers then we also look at our downtime what was the reason for downtime and then we have a feedback loop which I participate every week we have a call with we call it as a triangular meeting it is between uh, operations uh, engineering and our support organization. So we look at the issues that happen in production and then we also look at root cause, root cause analysis RCA we do an RCA and then we provide a feedback. So we incorporate whatever we can from that. Certain things cannot be incorporated because there may be like a disaster, hard drive crashed. But certain things we try to collect them and then before the beginning of the next release we try to incorporate, incorporate them. So we call that as a triangular meeting. That is one thing you know we, we have been doing that last six months which is uh, release metrics within DevOps and business. 
and uh, you can also you have to establish you know modes of communication because when things are you know in papers now it is all in a flow it is all in a kind of automated you need to have modes of communication because ops have to be very much comfortable whatever they are deploying in their space they are aware what is going in. So that is another uh, key aspect uh, we used to miss in the past. So in top of that not only having the DevOps in space that helped us to some extent but we had uh, other problems where you know once you have this automation every day QA comes in they want to start testing our application but what do you do now you know you have to have a box set up for all these kinds of environments and then you need to have data loaded for all these kinds of environments it is tedious process and then the way our QA works is every day they come up set up new boxes they start from scratch because they have a new build that would have last continuous integration they take that build and deploy. So I am talking about boundaries so this is not really DevOps so how we were able to solve this is we have a, our own product which is a provisioning engine. So we have a profile set up in our product where by click of a button from a QA across the globe our QA teams are in you know many places they are in Germany, Argentina, Brisbane, California and then in uh, India. So whoever comes on board today morning they click on a by click on a button they get their box and it also has a profile which is very much mapped to production profile. So after a few hours the guy coming in Argentina he starts at 6 p.m. Indian time. So he creates another box and uh, he does not have to struggle if there is any change it is already in our profile set up. So this is one of the key success to make our things work faster even though it is that is why I mentioned as boundaries of uh, DevOps. Not only that it also you know you can pick option like you know you, I want CentOS, I want uh, SUSE or uh, I want Windows and we also have option to pick 32 bit versus 64 bit things like that. So it is a very big uh, win for our QA to provision the box on the fly and uh, same thing for our dev as well developers when they come on board once they test they want to test they want their own play area sandbox click off a button in 5 minutes you know they can provision a box from our own internal cloud. And uh, the other automation that we did was once DevOps things are working it is deployed to one of our customers. So if we deploy to our customer only you know they host with us. So in those cases we deploy and our ops have gone one level ahead this is not real DevOps but once you deploy they also have a code to go and make sure whatever has been deployed let us say it is a year file they have an automated program it goes and checks the year file make sure it is the latest version and if there is any new configuration that has been added go and make sure you know those configurations are on and off all those you know they have automated to some extent where you know they can play it and get the results back even though there is a manual thing we used to do but on a large scale it is very hard and tedious if you try to uh, some of our customers have 80,000 users and uh, our servers are deployed you know vast and they have several terabytes of data those have to be backed up. So some of these things are really helping us so once they test the deployed installed app in production they have their own automated to you know automated tool to run that also varies by release because they have to tweak there may be new features coming on board. So that is an exit criteria before we hand it over to our customer. And as I mentioned uh, we have our own internal cloud provisioning we also sometimes some people are uh, take the box every day we also have vapor cloud where you know it expires every week. So if somebody does not return their box next day we have a vapor cloud it automatically you know expires the box and puts it into the system. So here is uh, our some of our ops environment I took a smaller example where uh, we have a SDLC uh, we have a ALM product using which you know we manage our requirements our defects all the way you know build continuous integration and whole uh, distributed team they collaborate they use our environment you can pick any ALM tool does not matter. So that is how they collaborate and then we also have a data center. So I touch little bit where you know first QA guy who comes on board he provisions his box and then in 15 minutes he gets the whole environment set up and a new app is also deployed into his space and uh, similarly the next day he comes on board in a different time zone he get the same build same profile and the third guy and then uh, I also showed you about the developer who does the same thing and we also have developers distributed across uh, four different uh, countries geographic location and there are up to you know 70 people who again get the same thing 
and this really you know benefits and saves a lot of time. The last but least you know we also have production operations where once we have a new release coming out we put it in our uh, outside firewall for some of our uh, customers to go and play with the there they have a fine uh, ops profile where it's kind of almost mimics the same as QA profile and we provide an early release and this is again talks about agile where before our real release we get feedback from our customers we again incorporate it back into our system okay these are uh, some of the best practices i would have touched upon most of them where our ops have their own requirement stories so they come for sprint reviews which are op related and then uh, they also do some of the admin doc qualification where we provide a documentation for our customers how to install so in our alm space we have workflow where ops have to approve before it goes to you know continuous integration delivery for some of the ops related stories so that we have uh, tweaked in our uh, alm workflow and the next one is uh, ops also start test the way our customer installs some of the customers don't host in our system they host it themselves so what our operations do is they again take our product install it they try it on different databases using our documentation these are some of the practices that helped us and then uh, last one is you know the flags we have many flags to turn on off features based on what customer wants based on the licenses that they bought those things are also tested automatically as well as manual ops have the way to test both automatic and manual and then they have a, ops have an environment to build a snapshot they can go back to snapshot like 3 4 versions before after that includes the data and configuration and uh, last one is very critical where they have spent their heavy investment ops where whoever touches the environment in uh, between uh, in devops space they have like a very good audit home grown uh, build thing where there's only one guy finally who has uh, authority to go and see all the traceability everybody has their own somebody can build only workflow somebody can build only model and there's only one guy in the whole company who can go and look at the traceability he is like a security officer and he can check you know so there is very tight uh, security involved so we have spent a lot of time uh, building that as well so any questions so far i know i'm going uh, pretty fast have any of you uh, incorporated these uh, in your uh, organization okay sure good question so the way our backlog works right in agile um, when we start a release we have a backlog so we get requirement from customers so we call it as you know cr us yeah customer requested user stories we get requirement from customer so we create a separate backlog for that and then we get required for requirement from our uh, customer issues we call it as cr is customer requested issues okay and then we want to get some new features into our product based on the market things like that so we create our own new feature and ops typically have their uh, issues because there may be downtime because uh, application perform miserably and uh, there may be a lot of issues so they have their own requirements and uh, recently you know i got one of the ops requirements where they want to uh, they want us to run you know cross site scripting because the cross site scripting we are running today it's not good enough they want us to invest so we shortlisted a product which is very expensive it's like 30000 dollars year so because what happened is one of our customer they using best product which is like 30000 dollars we are using 5000 dollar product and they came up with the list of things oh we hosted your product in our uh, premises we ran this tool and we are seeing all this vulnerability how come you guys didn't see it so those things feed into a, as a requirement so we have a ops backlog and then we also have performance backlog so beginning of a release what we do is we take all these backlogs everybody have a owner for their backlogs and then we feed it to the product manager and he creates a priority so in our uh, alm tool you can rank them and you can prioritize them so that's how you know it ranked and gets into a release then we pick what between the reasons, they have some they may have some stories because in many cases the ops team would not be part of the same agenda they would have a team of their own
Yes. Um, that's true, but uh, see I gave you a good example of the security vulnerability where your product will still work, okay. Only thing is somebody can tweak through and you know publish, uh, put their JavaScript on the form and submit. So, ops is not developing features. Yes. It is the agility that develops features and ops is actually using it to create product ops. So, they are not developing Yes, yeah I take both of your points where you know you are right when we do the we, we have security vulnerability story we have a, actually you know um, nine stories for security vulnerability because different tools ha ha have to have some differences because some of them are using JavaScript some of them are using jQuery and we have like eight stories. So some of the ops requirement has to be uh, developed by dev with collaboration with ops. So before we go into um, continuous integration we also you know promote uh, dev, dev box testing where once a developer completes this he has a provision he has his own cloud box he puts it in there QA goes and plays there QA does not open a defect. So they play there before you know officially you know QA starts testing they on a day to day basis. We also promote uh, ask ops for their stories. Now you know the, pro the thing is you know it is also culture when you have ops backlog give their own stories you know they are also part of the system. They are collaborating well with us. In, in certain projects, it is very easy to have a very tight collaboration. In certain projects, it is not. Like when there are many different agile teams and the same ops team is actually catering to them. Yes. It is very tough, tough to have them be part of all the stories of all these teams. That is correct. And then they would have a separate backlog of their own. That is true. Whereas when the ops caters to one or two teams, it is very easy to get coupled with them. So it depends on the situation. It depends on the project. Right. Right, I, I give you an example, another example is one of our customer want us to upgrade our product currently you know qualified for uh, Red Hat 6.2. One of the customer said you know I find some vulnerability on the operating system itself, why do not you upgrade to 6.3. So things like that in those cases there is no dev involvement where you know it is just ops story and it is just ops involvement where they upgrade the profile in the cloud and it automatically provisions for dev QA and everybody and then they test it. Yes, yes, yes. that is right. That is correct. Yeah, I gave you the uh, rel upgrade, right? Red Hat upgrade is only off stuff, even though dev is aware. So that is in their backlog and the security vulnerability on both sides. I will give you another story we are working on currently we are fixing some of the uh, clustering our app can be clustered failover and things like that or make it active active that is another story we have uh, where you know developers and ops have to be working together because we have some caching in our system we have some caching mechanism where when you go into distributed server cache always stays currently the cache stays in one server we are working on a distributed cache where you know dev team is looking at uh, using an open source they are developing a distributed cache. In that case dev works on those stories they develop it and then you know ops comes into picture where you know when you have to configure those how do you configure that uh, common you know cache thing whether you know it can be built about I talked about packaging then ops comes into picture there and there may be cases where you know you may have to put those jars or whatever the uh, distributed cache. Uh, open source product maybe into your class path apps comes into picture there too they keep modifying our uh, profile so you know automatically it reflects into uh, 
our uh, dev profile, dev gets QA gets all in next day. They get it once they update the profile before provisioning the box. And even uh, yesterday we had another issue where somebody you know wants to add uh, beyond JDK 1.7, they want to add one more thing. It came from one of the customer, they want to add on. So last night I saw email uh, through our system that you know, yeah all developers there is email going around, all developers QA, uh, when you provision new box tomorrow you get your new profile, your JDK has, has been upgraded. So things like that uh, happens. So you had another question right sir? I covered? Sure. They are in like four countries as I mentioned, seven or eight sprint teams, they are in four countries and ops are only in two locations. So ops themselves are distributed. So when we have a separate backlog for the ops, then you know we bring them only those time because they do not have time at all. They work three shifts out of five guys so it's kind of hard so i understand it will be top of the list and we don't bombard them with uh, many stories within a release so I, I think you all made a good point because you know it varies by situation again you know, varies by scenarios things like that <coughs> let's uh, look at one of the case study so far you know whatever i showed was how we are doing it within our organization you have seen you know how we are doing it in cloud and how we are building it so one of our customer, uh, they use our product and then they build on top of it. So that's how our products are, our, our product is. So they take our product, they build on top of it. So from our product, you know, they get a deliverable out of our product and they want to, you know, continue doing DevOps. So we helped many of our customers and I'll just give you a case study. I cannot talk about the customer or the product, but you know, how we solve them. You can read our case study. So this is a utility company in US where uh, they had a uh, lot of regulation. They have to get things done and uh, they have some time frame and uh, there were too many people involved as I mentioned earlier like you know same operation person will not be doing the job every day. They have shifts, things like that. They have uh, no tolerance for errors, things like that. So we have done like a fully automated DevOps space with workflow, with your models that I explained to you earlier with different packaging. They have a web app as well as a client server app. And then um, it has reduced their defects and downtime in production a lot. Like uh, there are statistics in the industry you can Google and check, but people have typically said, you know, 20%, 30% of defects, downtime, SLAs have improved. So in our case, you know, it's I think six time reduction deployment time, okay. And the staff have been gone down to one. So this is one of the simplest case I took for this presentation. We have more complex. I think a simple one, we have a customer who has a Windows app and I, I left other ones like app, uh, they also have a SAP and uh, Linux, three different apps, but I just took .NET, they, it runs on Windows, it has a MySQL and today, you know, they were, uh, before implementing DevOps, they had like, uh, they have five servers and you know, five QA and then five production. So it typically takes 30 minutes for uh, deploying by an ops person to you know do each one of this and if you look at a simple you know workflow diagram below you can see through you know there are a lot of conditions where you know you have to decide whether you have to go continue deploying or you don't have to deploy so in this customer case if there's any failure happens we also automated the rollback where all the data that's been uh, deployed you know it goes back to the previous stage your uh, bill goes to the previous stage there's an automatic rollback as well. You can also program, that's an extreme case. You want to typically, you know, stop and check ask some manual intervention, but they want an automatic rollback. That's also implemented here. The workflow is a little bit complex. So after DevOps, what happened? They had their own homegrown, a uh, lot of scripts and shell scripts and, you know, Python and uh, so many combinations. So it's all consolidated into, you know, one simple workflow. That's what we did. And uh, there's a centralized, you know, uh, automation engine and then you know now by after your continuous integration delivery when you go once you go through all the approval process approved by QA then the workflow goes to release manager then uh, production so after it goes to release manager click off a button five minutes they get all the five production servers deployed that includes you know dynamically configuring 
on uh, different five servers. Five servers has different different workflow. The model is same, but the workflow is different. Uh, sorry, workflow is same, model is different. Sorry. So it takes only five minutes for them to deploy. So this is a good case study. You, you can come to our booth. You know, you can grab uh, this case study as well. So the final summary. Do you guys have any other questions? You know, eight years ago, right? I have small. I think eight years ago, we never had all these things. So I used to work for an insurance company uh, in Philadelphia, where uh, we used to have so many servers and you know, like 40 servers. And then we didn't have all these things. What I used to tell is, if there's any failure happens in production, it's because of the document given by Dev. So the Dev person has to take the whole team out for lunch. So it's you know, 20 dollars, 70 people in a team. It's like very expensive. So same thing with ops. Dev gave right requirement documents, and op mistyped some configuration and fails in production. We do the same reverse, where we ask our uh, ops guys to take everybody in the team for lunch. So it's 70 by 20 dollar. You can imagine. So that's how we were able to control eight years ago. Now you know you have all these. So in a summary, right? Uh, why we are uh, why need a DevOps? So what is the thing we are looking at? Is productivity and agility. So Dev wants agility at the same time you know we also have uh, productivity in place because we are automating a lot of things and we are also having control and uh, there are tools available where you know once you automate your workflow you can also create a document out of it those are again extreme cases some some customers follow that as well creating a document out of uh, your workflows or models and the next one is compliance and governance which i covered a little bit where uh, in your workflow you can have uh, security, you can have um, uh, <coughs> you can have end-to-end -end tracking and uh, things like that. And the last one is efficiency and cost. You can save cost because of downtime. You reduce defects in your production environment. And then uh, other thing is you know technology is not the only thing that can solve. You have to choose the right one that fits for you. Technology is not the only solution. Last one is you know best engineering practices. There are again, you know, a lot of engineering practices available, which has to be incorporated into your uh, DevOps. This is evolving uh, space. Four months ago, when I did the same presentation, there are only half of these slides, which was totally different. And this conference, it has changed a lot. So, best engineering practices have to be adopted. So, any other questions? Yes. I couldn't hear you. Uh, uh, did you encounter any situation where uh, the application's performance is very bad in production, but uh, good in uh, development? Yes. Good. Uh, I can give you another recent case. One of our customer uh, who is operating out of you know 20 countries, they use our product. And our product, right, you can load up stories. So our product has a tool where you can create stories. So one of our customer uh, had uh, 100 projects, they are going running 100 projects in parallel, they have 80,000 users and each project had like 1000 stories. They kept all the old stories and new stories, 1000 stories. So we used to, what we used to do in the past is in our DevOps space, uh, as you have seen in the staging, we used to take one of our customer data and then you know we load it up in our staging and we used to test, that is the last phase of, of our uh, DevOps testing, we used to do that. And last uh, more than a year and a half ago, we stopped that practice because we want to get more tight into, we do not want to expose our customer data even within our company. So we got rid of those practices. And in this situation uh, where you know we built our own data, we have automation tool. So it goes and runs, click off a button, somebody recorded it. Keep on creating you know story A, B, C, D and A1, A2, A3, it goes on. It creates hundreds. So we never had hundred into thousand stories in our automation. So it worked fine here and customer went there, customer kept all the stories for last four years. So when you go to the our application, click on it, it took forever and you know you have web timeout, right? It times out in 20, uh, some companies set it up for three minutes, uh, some have set it up for 20 minutes, so it timed out. We have those situations. So that is where our triangular meeting comes in place, where we have engineering ops support. So it is we do a weekly thing, we do look at an RCA. So uh, last week I attended a meeting where I said, you know, we need to have automation to mimic this and have uh, environment always available. Yeah. 
Okay. So, where uh, we do all this uh, performance testing and uh, you know, uh, there is a live like environment uh, where we do this performance uh, testing. Okay. You know, that's how we are making uh, DevOps people, uh, you know, people job uh, much, much easier. Okay. Kuri, we have the same, we picked one of our uh, largest customer, I again give you the same example, 80,000, 20 different countries. We took that customer uh, hardware and their data and then we have that always available in our performance lab. So, performance lab after our continuous integration, right, we have our own uh, QA environments where we all do this and we have CI, CD and then our performance lab also runs their testing. It is a daily uh, like a, when somebody commits, they parallelly run their testing with that environment. So, we will never know, we have to keep on contacting a customer because within 3 months our customer uh, acquires some other company and then they merge systems and they pull uh, their code and stuff. And then you know, within uh, without our knowledge, you know, it explodes. So our test data goes out uh, out of sync in like you know three months. Month. This is one of the example where you know, one of our customer, I think he uh, acquired other company and they merged. They had their own product and they merged and moved all the stories here. We explored. We never knew about this. So some cases we have issues. Yeah. How often we release our product? We, uh, our product has two release cycles, two release cycles a year. So, our major releases are in June and uh, just uh, middle of before Christmas, December. And uh, we also have a hot fixes, hot fixes where customers really dead in a water. So, that goes on a parallel track and we also have patches that goes on a parallel track. That can happen anytime. Patches are like three months. Your staging environment, yes. uh, does it happen at every sprint or only uh, pre-release? Our uh, staging environment happens pre-release, but I talked about PSR, uh, we call it as PSR, it is a performance lab. They have an environment that happens daily. So, that is where you know we have the whole staging is just uh, pre-production and uh, performance is the one happens daily and we all get an automated email. How is the performance? Last night we had an email saying degraded by 30 percent. <laughs> so, okay. Any other questions? So, what are the challenges with DevOps? Like, is there some situations where DevOps doesn't work properly? Uh, mostly collaboration. There is always that tight thing. Now, we have given them ownership. They have their own backlog. That has solved some of our issues where, you know, DevOps, uh, they do not want any, any change. That is our biggest challenge. Uh, so, you know. Even the ops does not want change? Or, or the they do not want us to change their environment because we keep on, our product is based out of all open source products underneath, under, underneath our whole product. We have up to, you know, 25 to 30 open source products underneath. Any of one of them are, you know, upgraded. Let us say either it is a struts or, you know, Tika or anything we upgrade, review board. Those are all open source products we upgrade. Then, you know, we may have some changes in our operation, but you know there is always a pushback because they are scared to you know move that in. That is why you know we are trying to get them in into the sprint and review. Whenever we think uh, in our store, in our uh, artifacts also we have some flags where you know uh, we customize some of our artifacts where in a story level we have a flag. Does this require an automation? Does this require a doc chain? Does it require release? So, we also have a note for ops as well. So, that you know they can be part of the sprint review. Thank you. Uh, did I answer your question or no? I went round and round. Uh, partly yes. Okay. Partly yes. You can you talk. You can talk to me later. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm almost done. Uh, any other questions? I think I got a cue that you know we ran out of time. So if you, you can come to our booth and you know sign up, we are uh, giving away two iPads. So it'll be announced tomorrow evening. Okay. That's all. I think I'm done. Any questions? Okay, thank you guys.